what we've got to talk about today. So if we look at our learning target for today, we're talking about creating a function, constructing a function that's an additive and or multiplicative transformation of another function. So if you remember, I'll just put this next information here, our toolkit of parent functions. These are the things that we're going to slip and slide all over the coordinate plane, okay? All of these functions should be familiar to you except for the last three. We talk about those in unit three. Those are our trig functions that we're responsible for. But the good news is everything we learned today applies to them as well. Okay, so everything we do, we're going to jump in next unit talks about uh, exponential and logarithmic functions, but everything else should be very familiar to you. Okay, knowing those parent functions and how they're formed helps you to do all of our transformations. Okay, greatest integer function is usually the one that's um, most difficult. We also call that the step function. Any reason, any idea why? It looks like stairs, right? It looks like stairs. We call it the step function, where we're closed on the left, open on the right. Okay, and that's how we remember those. So that's just a reminder of all your different functions that we could see. That was what you focused on primarily in Algebra 2, was dealing with those specific functions and their behavior. All right, well, we're going to move into the abstract in pre-cal. So we're going to take things that are combinations of functions and do the transformations to them, okay? So let's walk back through what all those transformations are and how we get them and what they mean and how we do it, okay? And we'll kind of progress through this. Okay. So let's start right here, okay? Let's just take a parabola because he's nice, pretty, and easy, all right? And let's talk first about vertical and horizontal translations, okay? If I want to take my parabola and move it up, all right, we're just going to add on a constant at the end of our function, okay? So whatever we're doing, our parabola, we would add a constant to the end. If we want it to go down, we just subtract, okay? So our function and we subtract. <coughs> okay? So, those vertical translations affect the y values of my function, okay? It's going to mess with the y values of my function. We're going to move it up. We're going to move it down. A horizontal translation, all right, so left and right, this time we're going to mess with what's in parentheses with our x. If we want it to go to the right, we're going to do minus C. We do an opposite, okay? We throw it in a parenthesis. If we want it to go left, inside that parenthesis, we're going to add a constant. Those affect my X values. Right, so our X values are going to change. That look familiar? Hopefully so. Okay. All right, then we get to reflections. Okay, if we want to reflect it over the x axis, what does it take to do a reflection? It takes a negative. Okay, so to flip it over the x-axis, we're going to do a negative out in front. To flip it over the y-axis, we're going to put the negative inside. Who has NASCAR fans. They go to Bristol every year. All right, 
so now let's talk about the next one, okay? You're probably used to seeing this um, horizontal and vertical stretch and shrink or compression, things like that. AP uses the word dilation, okay? They just use the word dilation. Um, and that's what they're going to expect us to use in terms of our terminology. But basically, vertical, meaning up and down, we're going to multiply, all right? So y equals c times f of x, all right? So any kind of vertical dilation, some constant out in front of our function, okay? If I want it to get narrow, we're going to let that constant be greater than 1, okay? If I want it to get wider, our constant's going to fall between 0 and 1. So if I have a fraction in front, it doesn't go up as much, right? If I have a whole number in front, it goes up a little bit more. So that's what makes it narrow. Those affect our vertical dilations affect our y values. Right? And you're going to see why I write that here in just a second when we do some looking at stuff. Okay. Now, the one that seems to be most tricky for most people are those horizontal dilations, okay? If you look at those two pictures, they look identical. Do you notice? Okay. Um, but when we do a horizontal dilation, that means it's going to mess with our x. And so we're going to put that constant inside the function with x. y equals f of c times x. The good news is if we want it to be narrow, again, that C is going to be greater than 1. If we want to spread it out, that C is going to be between 0 and 1. Okay, so that's the same for both of them. This is going to affect my X values. So now two special notes. If we're looking at a vertical dilation, okay, I said it affects your y values. We're going to end up multiplying our y values by the absolute value of whatever number is out there, okay? So we multiply by that number that's out in front, okay? absolute value of C. Mm -hmm. But when we get to those X values, this is the only one that's a little bit tricky. We multiply our X values by the absolute value of the reciprocal of C, okay, by one over C, right? I like to think of it as division, but if we keep it all in terms of multiplication, which is what most mathematicians do. Okay, you're multiplying your x values by 1 over c. All right, I'm going to show you what we mean by that here in just one second. Okay. You know you're getting old. This is what my husband said last night. He goes, you know you're getting old when your Valentine's Day is spent eating a salad with Publix chicken, uh, chicken tenders. That's what I stopped and got on the way home last night. I was in my pajamas by 4.30. We ate salads with Publix chicken tenders on them. And I think I had a leftover brownie in the refrigerator. I'm not sure. Anyway, but we had some kind of, and I was like, I love you a little bit. Like, I was done. He goes, that's when you know you're old. And I was like, well, it happens. Okay. I didn't used to think 50 was very old until I got to almost 50. Now I feel 100. Right, so let's do some examples. Let's start basics. Okay. Let's start basics. So here we have a new fu uh, function, f of x. All right. It happens to be what? It's a parabola. 
all right? It's an x squared equation. They didn't give me the formal equation, but let's talk about what they want me to do to that parabola, okay? So if we look at this first one, what do they want me to do to it? Left two and up three, okay? Well, let's do that, okay? Take a couple of points, move it left two and up three. And so if we did that, starts starting at over two, so I'm gonna go back to be right here. Oh, nope, gotta do both transformations, Miss Moore. And then go up three, one, two, three. Some of our text is gonna land right there, all right? All the other points would do the same, but this looks like a parabola with a leading coefficient of one because I go over one and up one on the original. And there's my pretty picture, okay? So just using that abstract notation to mark your transformation. Okay. All right, well, let's talk for a second about the next one, okay? I've got a negative two, f of x, and then minus three. What's it want me to do this time? Flip it upside down. What else? Take it down three. Yeah, dilate it by two, okay? So if we do that, if we think about where our vertex is, all right, we wanna take it down three, one, two, three. All right, and then we're gonna flip my points upside down. So we know instead of opening up, it's gonna open down. Instead of over one and down one, how are we gonna move? Over one, down two. Over one, down two. All right, for our symmetric little parabola. So that's when it's a function that we know, okay? We know how to move a quadratic. Right. Just pull those points right off the graph. Right. So question about the notation or doing that for just our basic parent toolkit, okay? More than likely, this is not what we will see, okay? But I want you just to practice a little bit to be sure we understand the notation. Okay. All right. What I anticipate we'll see a lot more of are like example two, three, and everything else that I've included, okay? Um, so it says, let G be the function that's a transformation of the function F, such that G of X equals two F of X minus three plus one. Describe the transformations of F that result with the function of G, okay? And so I wanna kind of walk you through the verbiage that they're going to expect in terms of a written response. This could fall in a free response question where you'd have to write the sentence, or it could be multiple choice where they would give you a bunch of sentences, okay? So when we talk about changing a function, we talk about changing the x's, then we change the y's, okay? So that's how they're going to describe it, how we change the x's, how we change the y's. And so if we look at this one, which number or which part of this is going to change my x values? Yeah, the minus three, okay? So this is the first thing we would say. We don't say, I mean, it's got to be a sentence. So we're talking about the function or g of x, okay? So the function is horizontally translated. three units to the right. Okay, so that's the first thing we did. Okay, so if we talk about changing our X's, our X's are gonna be translated horizontally three units to the right, okay? Then we talk about what, the, what happens to the Y's, all right? And we do them in the order that they appear from left to right. So what's the first thing that's gonna affect the Y values? Yeah, the dilation, okay? So it's translated three units to the right and vertically dilated by 
by a factor of two. Okay. And then the last thing we do is we push it up, right? So we would say it is vertically translated up one unit, okay? Now, that seems excessive, all right, to say all that. When we could just say, go to the right, dilate by two, move it up, right? But that's not what they expect, all right? They're gonna expect us to use some good mathematical language there. All right, see if you can do the next one. All right, let's see what we got there. Okay. What do we think? What would be a good way to start? Okay. What are we going to do first to the X's? Yep, we're going to horizontally dilate it. Okay, now here's where it's tricky. a factor of, we would actually multiply by one half, okay? So you always do a reciprocal when it comes to the horizontal dilation, okay? So if there's a two in there, we'll say the factor is one half because that's what we're multiplying the x values by, okay? So it's different. The one inside is different, okay? It's horizontally dilated by a factor one half. Then we talk about what we do to the y's. The y values we're gonna multiply by four, okay? And vertically dilated by a factor of four. And then the last thing we do is we address that negative in the front and we say and reflect it over the x-axis. So it's what we do to X, then what we do to Y. What do you mean left to right? When we got to what we do to Y. So I always did, I did what I did to X first. What I did to X first was horizontally translated. Then what I did to Y was this. Now in terms of the reflection, you could actually say that in either order because they're both right there in the front with the reflection and the vertical dilation. Okay. Do what? No, you're good. So it's one half when whatever's by X. Yes, it's reciprocal. When it, whatever's by X, it's a reciprocal. So if one third was there, our factor would be what? Three. Okay, it's a reciprocal. All right, good questions. Anything else? about that, just the word part of it, okay? 
All right, let's look at four. I really liked four for lots of reasons. I think this is more along the lines of what we're going to see. Okay, they're going to give us this function, call it H, and then tell us to do something to it. All right, to graph it. Here's the version that they want us to graph. They want us to graph K of X, which is the opposite of H of 2X plus 1. Okay, so what I want to do right now is just kind of think about what those transformations are, and then I'm going to do it to all the important points that I can see. All right, to help me create the graph. So when I look at this one, here's the first thing I notice. To x, I'm going to multiply all my x's by that reciprocal, which would be 1 half. Okay. All of my y values, we are going to negate. We're going to flip it over the x-axis. Okay, but not only are we going to flip them over, we're going to add one. Okay, so that's what we're going to do, okay, to all the important points on this graph. Okay, we're going to multiply the x by half or cut it in half. Then we're going to do the y value in the opposite direction and add one. All right. Okay, so let's go a point at a time and see if we can get this right. The first point that I notice is right here. It's negative 4, negative 3, okay? So let's do what it says. If I multiply negative 4 by 1 half, what do I get? Negative 2. So I'm going to go to negative 2. I'm going to do my y value, which it was down 3. Now I would do what? Up 3, but then I need to add 1. So I'm actually going to go up. Okay, so there's my first point. All right, so let me walk you back through that. Okay, I'm going to try to do them in colors so that they match so you can see which one goes with which. Okay, so first point, x was negative 4, so I did half of that, which was negative 2. I do the opposite y value. <laughs> it was down 3, so I went up 3, and then I added 1, so I actually went up 4. Okay, so walking through that process. Let's do the next point. I'm going to do it in green. All right. The next point that's easy to see is that one right there, all right, at the top of that peak. Okay. The x value <coughs> is negative 2. What's half of that? Negative 1. Okay. I'm going to do the opposite y value. So instead of up 1, I'm going to go down 1. But then I need to add 1. So which way would it send me? back to zero, okay? Because I was at negative one and I added one, so I end up at zero, okay? All right, let's do this point. Okay, my x value is zero. What's half of zero? Oh, that's good, okay? The y value is down 2, so this time I'm going to do what at 0? Go up 2 and then add 1, so where would I land? At 3. Okay. All right, so I'm creating my new picture. Okay. Let's do this point. Okay. What's my x value? Two. Two. What's half of it? One. Okay. My y value is at zero in the original and the reciprocal or the uh, opposite of zero is still what? <coughs> zero, but I need to add one. So what am I going to do? Go up one. Yep. Just connecting all my dots. Okay. Let's do this hole right here. All right. It's going to still be a hole when I do the transformation. All right. What X value is there? Four. Half of that is two. 
Uh, that point went up two, so which way am I going to go? I'm going to go down two, but then what do I have to do? Add one, so I go back up one. That is my hole. All right, almost done. Let's do a couple more. Um, let me pick a good color. Let's do a dark blue. Okay. Let's do this point that is just a point all by itself. Okay, it's still going to be a part of the transformation. All right, should line up with the whole. So let's see. The x value is 4, so half of that would give me 2. Uh, I would go up 1 and then up 1 more. So there is my dot that just corresponds to that closed in circle. All right, last one. Okay, final point right here. What X value is that? Six, okay. What's half of six? Three. That one went up four. Which way am I going to go? Down. Down four. One, two, three, four. But then I have to add one, so I go back the opposite direction. Okay. Here is my transformation. Okay, I'm just going to highlight it so you can see it. So you have to take each point that you can see and do what the equation says, all right? So I want you to take a second kind of digest that, all right? Let me know what question you have. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. How do I know what I'm doing to it? Okay. So, if we're looking at what we're doing to the Y value, all right, it comes from whatever is outside of the X where the X's are, all right? So, negative out there means I need to go in opposite direction, and then whatever's at the end sends it up or down, okay? So, when I do my opposite, all right, so like on this one, it was originally down three. When I did the opposite, I went up three, but that, then I'm not done, okay? I had to go the opposite direction and then add one more or go up one more, okay? And so then on the ones that were below the axis when we started or above the axis, like that green point, when I take it down one, all right, so it's in the opposite direction, when I add the one, it's still going up one. That's why it moved to zero, okay? Good question. Right. Something else. That to me is the toughest part of what we do is right there. All right. It's taking those weird graphs and doing all the things to it and getting the right picture. Okay. What you're going to do to X, then what you do to Y. Okay. All right. Rock and roll. Scooting right along. Let's look at some of this. AP loves to ask you questions in lots of different forms. Okay. The skills are all pretty much the same. But they're going to ask you in lots of different ways. They may give you a graph. They may give you words. And I think this one's really good. It says the domain of F is negative 3 to 5. The range is 1 to 3. Find the domain and range of G. And G has a transformation to it. Okay? So here's what we have to think about. What are we doing to the X values? Okay? So let's look at it. Which transformation in that function is going to affect the X values? the plus three okay so for our x's our we are going to do what three to the left or subtract okay so our x's we are going to subtract three okay now what are we going to do to our y's not first I'm 
multiply by 2. So y times 2 and then subtract 4. Okay, so multiply y by 2 and then subtract 4. Okay, so when we talk about the domain and the range of g, okay, the domain of g, well, if f was negative 3 to 5, we're just going to do what we need to do to the x values, which is what? Subtract 3. What's negative 3 minus 3? Negative 6. And what's 5 minus 3? 2. Domain deals only with the x's, so we just subtract 3 to both elements of the domain. Okay. For the range, we're going to do what we have to do to the y values. Okay. So to our y values, we want to multiply by 2 and then subtract 4. Okay. Well, what's 1 times 2? Two? 2. Subtract 4. Negative 2. Then do the same thing to the 3. What's 3 times 2? 6. And 6 minus 4. And there's your new domain and range. Okay. So all we have to know are what we do to the x's and the y's. Yes, ma'am. How did you get negative 6 and 2? I subtracted 3 from the two x values in my domain. All right. Any other question about that? What's the point of the table? The table goes to the next question. <laughs> yeah, table goes to 6. Otherwise, it would be pointless, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right. So, question about domain and range. This is going to come up. It's one of the questions they really liked in the practice stuff. Okay. All right. Let's look at this next one. AP loves a table. Okay. They love a table. They want you to be able to do things graphically, algebraically, verbally, and with a table. Okay. So, multiple representations. This one is actually just evaluating a function. All right, so they give me a table of values for a reason. If we look right here, they give me a function, h of x, all right? It's 3 times p of 2x and then subtract 1, all right? So what we're going to do is actually evaluate a function. So h, wrong thing. So h of negative 1, I'm going to fill that into my function over here. 3 times p, the 2, in place of x, what am I going to put? Negative. negative 1, and then minus 1, okay? And we're just going to work with that right-hand side and work it inside out, just like you do when you evaluate a function, okay? So I'm going to keep the 3. I'm going to keep the p. What's 2 times negative 1? Negative 2. And then I keep the minus 1, all right? At this point, we're going to use the table to evaluate the function, all right? I use the table to evaluate the function. So I keep the 3. What's P of negative 2 from my table? 1. So I put a 1 right there, and then I'm going to subtract 1. And now it's just, out, uh, it's just numeric. What's 3 times 1 minus 1? It's 2, and that's my answer. Okay, we're just evaluating a function, but we use the table to get that value in the end. All right, let's do another one, then I'll let you try one. Okay, let's do h at 2. Still using this function, all right? The function says take the 3, keep your p function, 2, then plug in something. What number are we going to plug in? We're going to plug in a 2, all right? And then I'm going to subtract 1, all right? Let's simplify a little bit. That gives me 3 times P of, what's 2 times 2? It's 4, and I'm going to subtract 1, okay? Now I'm going to pull a value from the table. What is P at 4? It is 3. So 3 goes in that parenthesis. OK, 
okay? Just evaluating that function. And then I do the arithmetic. Three times three is nine. Take away one and I get eight. Okay, so getting used to evaluating functions using a table. We do that a lot in calculus. Okay. Try that last one. What'd you get? Negative four is correct. All right, negative four is correct. So we would take three times P at two times zero and then subtract one. Two times zero is just zero. We pull it from the table. P at zero is negative one. Three, excuse me, times negative one is negative three minus one, negative Four. Okay, so I wanted you to practice that a second because it comes into play in the next one. All right, All right let's take a look at this one. <clears throat> gives me a table, okay? The table above gives the values for a function h its selected values of x. So let k of x equal a times h of bx plus c where a, b, and c are positive constants. In the xy plane, the graph k is constructed by applying three transformations to the graph in this order, and I think that's important. A horizontal dilation by a factor of one half, a vertical dilation by a factor of three, and a vertical translation by one unit, okay? So first of all, it tells me how to construct the graph k. Okay, how to construct the function k of x. So let's do that. Let's construct k of x. Okay. All right, we know k of x is coming from my function h, so we're going to do something to the h function. All right, bless you. All right. So if we're going to do a horizontal dilation, does that affect x or affect y? <laughs> x okay if we're dilating by a factor of one half what's going to have to be next to x two good okay then we're going to do a vertical dilation by a factor of three that's going to affect y where does it have to go out in the front so i'll put a three out there and then a vertical translation by one unit what do you think plus one at the end, unless it says down, we'll assume it's positive, okay? So plus one at the end. So there we've written the function, okay? So that's part one of that question, all right? Part two says to find k of negative six, and this is where we're gonna use the table, all right? So we constructed the function, now we're gonna evaluate it. So k of negative six is gonna equal three h, of two times negative six and then add one so which was what we just did in the problems above okay three times h of negative 12 and then add one what is h at negative 12. it is just one it's that y value and so three plus one gives me four Good question. That's a good question. Yes. That is correct. This won't be on the quiz. The quiz stopped with what you did on through eleven. So seven through eleven. Okay. 
Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Those were all good ones. Okay, let's look at the next one. I like this one too. So the function P is given by P of X equals 3X minus 2. The graph of R is the image of the graph of P after a horizontal translation of 4 to the graph of P. If R of X equals AX plus B, find the values of A and B. Okay, lots of words there. Play with it for a second. See what you think you might do with it. All right, I really like the language that's used in this because, again, AP <coughs> likes to kind of mess with your brain in terms of the language, okay? It tells us here that R is the image of P after a horizontal translation. In other words, we want to take P and translate it four units, okay, horizontally. So, think about that. I would keep the three that was out in front of my X, <coughs> I'm going to keep the minus 2 at the end, but we're going to mess with it, all right, with the x values, because I want a horizontal translation of 4. It didn't say 4 to the left, so we're going to assume it's positive, okay? So what should go inside of my parenthesis? Minus 4, okay? And that is the transformation. But now what's tricky is they want r of x in the form ax plus b. In other words, they want it in slope-intercept form. Okay, well, how do I do that after I've written this function? Dash multiply it out, right? I just do the distributive property, and I end up with 3x minus 14. So to answer the question, what number's A and what number's B? 3 and negative 14. So again, just another kind of creative way to ask a question about a transformation. Right. Most everything you're going to see from AP, because the whole um, standard is about constructing an equation, all right, it's probably going to fall somewhere in these last few examples, okay, uh, in terms of generating an equation. All right, last one, okay. So I wanted to kind of pull in a bunch of things that we've done and apply it to here, all right? Because when we get to free response questions, that's what they do, all right? They take a bunch of stuff and throw it into one question or related and ask you how it's all too far. All right, so let's take a look at this one, all right? So they gave me a function there of f of x, and they want me to find the domain and range of f, okay? So do that real quick. The domain range of F. Y'all are allergic to pre-cow today. 
happens. My friend I went to Disney with, she was, she's allergic to Disney. She <coughs> sneezed and coughed the whole time. Like, how can you be allergic to Disney? Okay. What do we get for domain? Domain deals with X's. So the X's go from negative 5 to 5. I'm going to use interval notation just, okay, but you could have done negative 5 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 5, okay? So either one of those would have worked, all right? When we do range, range is our y values. So negative 3 to 3. Or again, this time, though, be sure if you use the inequality notation, you put y in the middle instead of x, okay? So that's a common mistake. I use interval not notation more often just for, so I don't have to write as much. Okay, either is four. Yeah, either is fine. And you'll see it used interchangeably on the AP exam. So, just depends on who wrote that question as to what they prefer. Okay, so now they tell me, well, here's G of X. This is G of X. Right? Find the new domain and range. Okay, find the new domain and range. Think about what you would do to X and what you would do to Y to get that new domain and range. Try that part. Okay. Based on the equation, what are we doing to every x value? We're adding 1. We do the opposite of what's right there. We're going to add 1. Okay. What are we going to do to every y value? Multiply by 2 and add 3. Multiply by 2 and add 3. Okay, so knowing what we do to which values is important, okay? We're going to add 1 to the x's, and we're going to multiply the y's by 2. So in doing so, my new domain, if I just add 1, those are both x values, my new domain is going to become what? Negative 4, 6. Okay. My new range, those are both y values, we're going to multiply by 2 and then add 3. Right. So what are we going to get for those new y values? And 9, yeah. Okay, negative 3 and 9. So domain with both, we're both x's, <coughs> range, we're both y's. We do the appropriate transformation. Okay. Now, in uh, C, the point 4,2 on f of x transforms to which point on the graph of g? Well, that point has an x and a y. So do what you got to do to them, all right, to get your new point. Okay, what are we going to do to the 4? Add 1 because it's an x, and it's going to give me 5. What are we going to do to the 2? Multiply by 2 and add 3. So 2 times 2 is 4, plus 3 is 7. Okay? So doing all the things, all right, in one big question. Okay? All right. Next one, find g at 0. Okay? So let's take our g of x function. And we'll write it back down so we can see it. 2 times f of x minus 1 plus 3, right? And we want to find g at 0, which means everywhere I have an x, I'm going to put a 0 in its place. So 2 times f of 0 minus 1 plus 3. 2 
2 times f of negative 1 <coughs> plus 3. Now, I don't have a table this time, okay? But can I get the y value for f of negative 1? It's okay. You make sure you're all right. Okay. Where could we go to get f at negative 1? The graph. Yeah, let's just go up here. When x is negative 1, what's the function? 3. So I take 2 times 3 plus 3, and my final answer, 9. Okay, so I had to pull that y value from the graph. Question about that one. All right. Now, E is probably one of my favorite questions because we go back to increasing, okay? Increasing and decreasing. That was all on our very first test, okay? We want to know where is G of X increasing, okay? But the problem is I don't have a picture of g of x, all right? But I do have a picture of f of x, and I know how to manipulate f to get g, all right? So let's start at f, and let's find where is f of x increases, okay? Where is increases? Let's find that first, okay? So let's find where our original function increases, and then we can find where the transformation increases, all right? So, what intervals does f of x increase on? Where does it start increasing? Negative 4. Negative 4. And that goes to negative 1. Okay, so it increases right here. Where else does it increase? 1, 2, 4. Now, those are intervals of x. They're not ordered pairs, okay? They're intervals of x. So if we want to know where g of x increases, we're going to apply the x transformation, okay? And what was the x transformation? Plus 1 to all of those, okay? So negative 4 plus 1 would be negative 3, negative 1 plus 1, 0, 1 plus 1, 2, and 4 plus 1, 5. Okay, so those intervals, and the mistake I see people make on that one, all right, is that they try to do the x and the y, all right? But when we're doing increasing and decreasing, it's just x values. We have Brian Calhoun to the main office, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right, last question. I really like this one, too. How many solutions does the equation g of x equal to zero have? All right, and explain our, our reasoning, okay? Well, let's just kind of talk through that for a second. Let me take that g function. So two times f of x minus one plus three and set it equal to zero, okay? And I want you to forget for a second that it's in function notation, all right? But if I wanted to get that y value, that function part by itself, what would I do? If there wasn't an f of x minus 1 there, if there was a big fat n there, what would I do to get that n by itself? Subtract 3 and divide by 2. Okay? So let's do that. Let's subtract 3. So just like solving an equation, so I have 2 f of x minus 1 equals negative 3, all right, and then I'm just going to divide by 2, and so I get f of x minus 1 is equal to negative 3 over 2, all right. Question about what I did, all right, solving an equation looks weird, but it is solving an equation nonetheless, all right. So what we're doing here is we've got this graph F, okay? And X minus 1 says, hey, I'm just going to scoot that whole picture to the right one. Is it going to change where it goes up and down at that point? No, okay? 
If I wanted to equal negative 3 over 2, let's go back up here to the picture. That's this line right here, negative 1 and a half. Okay, even though my graph would be shifted over one, it's nowhere different vertically. How many times does my picture cross? Once, we have one solution, okay? So if I can get the function part alone, where X is just slid, you know, translated left or right, I can then put in what number it's equal to and figure out how many times it crosses, okay? Because it's not gonna change where it moves up and down. It's just sliding it left and right. Okay, so it has one solution. We would say um, G intersects the graph only once. Okay, only once, and that graph is our explanation. All right, drawing that line there. Okay, what questions do you have? Okay, it's function transformations, looking at it a little differently than you've looked at it before, all right? But pretty much the same thing you've been doing since Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. So, here's what we're going to do, all right? On worksheet A, these are the problems I'd like to highlight. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 15. Okay, I wanted to give you some time to kind of work through that today while we're here in class, okay? Because tomorrow you have a quiz on 1, 7 through 11, all right? So that's the two <coughs> lessons you did while I was gone and the lesson I taught before I left, okay? So those three lessons that you need to study for. I really would like your focus tonight to be just to kind of study and work on this. What we'll do when we come in tomorrow is we'll start with the quiz if we all finish uh, and have time left, then we'll take on any questions from worksheet A that I don't get to today, okay? So that's kind of how I anticipated doing that. Um, when we get back, of course, you're off Monday. I don't know if you know that for um, President's Day. On Tuesday, we'll cover the last two sections. It's all application-based, okay? Which means, you know what? Words, all right? So we'll do that, review, test, test corrections next week, all right? So if you've looked at the calendar, that's what's on there for next week. Okay, um, I am going to introduce a project to you guys tomorrow. Okay, uh, it'll be due on the 28th, and we'll talk about that as well. Okay, all right, you're free to work. It's about the 